Where do you get your inspiration from? You know, the deep bass, dirty, <laughs> dirty rap. Ireland <laughs> <laughs> really is my favorite. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> let's go. I love it. I, I love it. Um, so, but no, it's like I'll sort of start by thinking of like just random stuff. Like, okay, like Joy Division, but then also oh. I like, you know, NWA. Yay, 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 yay. Yeah. Follow me, yeah. that kind of thing. Under all is the land, the real, real, the real estate. Yeah. Courtney, your friends, about to show you how to generate wealth. Well, get educated, do for yourself. Yeah. Add a couple notches to your belt. Yeah. Under all. Welcome to episode four of Under All Is The Land. Today we're going to be talking about what makes a good flip good. Good flip, bad flip. What's the deal? And I am here with my rock star co-stars, Silka Fernald. Hello. And Dominique Madden. Hi. I think we should dive right into this. Do we know flips? We do. We do. We, we know do. it from the sales side and from the buy side. But, you know, I do feel like maybe some flippers out there who decide they're going to get into this profession don't do their research. So we're here to help you with that, flippers out there. Don't do your research. Let's start with some, let's start with things that flippers should do, like systems things. Can we start there? Well, start with the bones? Okay. Start with the systems, yeah. <laughs> let's do it. Okay. Well, I would say, oh, oh, when it comes to systems, I really think it depends on what you're starting with. You know, if okay. a system is completely failing, you should probably replace it. Let me ask you this. Would you advise your flipper to repair a sewer line? Yes. Yes, if it's if it's broken. What if it's functional but just old? No. No. What if it has a, <laughs> has a like, what do they call it when it, like, misaligns? It's like a little shit. Oh, a little a offset. Shit offset. offset. That's the thing. With the older sewer lines, what I've been told many a time by sewer line inspectors is that when they made the su those sewer lines, that just happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, if it's functioning, I just don't see why you would fix something that's not broken. Mm. You know, what's the point? You don't think a buyer expects that a sewer line is repaired? No, I don't think so. Okay. I, I mean, if it weren't broken, I wouldn't expect it to be fixed. But also, I mean, they say that these new sewer lines have such extensive lifespans. Mm -hmm. But the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> if a freaking hundred year old sewer line is still doing its thing and it's not broken, I'm not touching it. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm with Anique. Yeah. Fireplaces, chimneys. Mm. Do or don't do? I would say I would say generally it's a don't tough do. One. I think it depends on price point. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. That's okay. True. Yeah. So you're saying don't do an advertiser's decorative? Well, okay. A special, I guess it would also depend on where you are. Like in LA, the likelihood of someone actually using their fireplace is like, you know, slim to none. I mean, I know a few people who say they light one or two fires a year. Yeah. But, you know, it's really about the romantic vibe of a fireplace just being present. So if you're a flipper and you're working with a limited budget, then you're probably not going to want to put you know, $10,000 or whatever that fireplace needs to fix it versus maybe some other more prudent issues that are like things that people will use every day. Like but an don't HVAC you think system. that buyers are notorious for asking for huge fireplace credits? They are. And that's why they're so decorative. That's why they're so decorative. So if I'm advising my flipper to make a choice between a chimney and something else that maybe the buyers are going to use more, we're going to let go of the chimney, make it decorative. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think sure. so. Um, what about the roof? The roof still has a couple years life in it. Do we replace the roof if it doesn't need a full replacement or leave it there? So what do you oh. think? Oh. oh, sorry. No, no. I was, no, go. Are you go sure? if okay. you have a thought. I was going to say, <laughs> also it. dependent on yes. lifespan. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if someone's telling me that uh, it's, uh, you know, it's halfway through its useful life, mm -hmm. that could be on a, you know, 30 year shingled roof. It could be 15 years that it has left. What so. if it has five years left? I would Don't replace honestly it. probably not replace it. Just do maintenance? <laughs> if it's functioning, yep. you know, then yep. why would you replace it again? Do you, you think know, the buyers wasteful. expect at least that the sellers have done something to check this, like, condition of all the systems before they put the property on the market? Yes. They expect it, right? Yes. Because I know I've, I've had situations where I rep buyers and we do a roof inspection and it's like a hot mess, missing shingles, 
missing na- like nails are showing through, missing you know different that, kinds of things that are supposed to be on the roof right, to make water roll off. You know, uh, I'm at a loss for words. But for that's what, that what you would call a roof tune-up. So yeah. I, I I say yes to that. Yes, flippers like should do that. Like you don't have to redo the whole roof if there's life left, but tune it up so there's no missing shingles and nails and okay. popping up and that kind of thing. Okay. How about plumbing? For it, sure, you replace the plumbing. All the plumbing? Yes, because it's all most likely galvanized. Even the verticals? <laughs> oh, you're really getting into this. I'm going I all the way like in. It. I'm going all the way in. <laughs> I like that. Okay. I would for okay. sure say if there's yes. old plumbing, replace yes. it. Okay. Replace it. Even you... the verticals? Yes. <laughs> Even the verticals. Even the water main line Do you at know... the city connection. If it's uh, oh. galvanized plumbing, yeah. that's where our drinking water comes from. Replace, replace it. it. Waste lines, replace it as needed. Mm-hmm. But it's easier to replace plumbing when the walls are open than right. having the buyer go in later because, oh, this thing just broke and now we have to get into our nice house and yeah. tear yeah. down walls. And Plus, if there is, yeah, if there is mm-hmm. a water issue, then now you're looking at behind the wall problems and maybe, it, you know, you don't know when it's happening. So, like, if it's something that happens for weeks or months or, you know, even days... You could end up with mold. And Do at you that think point, buyers you know the open. value of full plumbing replacement? Like, do you think they know how much it costs? I, I think a no. lot of people have misconceptions no. about costs of things, you mm-hmm. know, but I actually think that, you know, I mean, okay, the, the prices are rising, but for a long time, I feel like people overestimated, mm-hmm. actually. Yeah. You know, and now I feel like because of HGTV, they're underestimating and <laughs> overestimating their ability to take it on. <laughs> Thanks, so HGTV. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Um, okay, so this might seem obvious. I don't know. But electrical. Um, yeah. If the panel's older, <laughs> should a flipper replace it? If it's not one of the recalled panels, should they replace it? Well, it's not that expensive. You might as well replace it. Yeah. I mean, and also the, the thing with old panels is that they're usually undersized mm-hmm. for the kind of ener- like electricity that we use now. So like if it's not 200 amps, then I say upgrade it, especially mm-hmm. because it is reasonable. Okay. Yep. HVAC system. Yes, for sure. Functions, but is 15 years old. Well, then it probably runs on the old Freon type. Freon? Yeah. I think most air conditioning units have Freon. No, what I'm saying, the old type that's recall that you can't buy anymore. So I feel like if there is a question, replace. There's a new type of HVAC that doesn't use Freon? No, they they use Freon, but it's not the Freon that's been discontinued. There's this Freon that you can't get anymore. The discontinued Freon. The old one. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I was being dense there. I do remember what you're talking about. So So it's like if it's going to be inconvenient for the buyer to add Freon or maintain the system, then replace it. It's worth replacing. Mm -hmm. So we're talking really about like, is it possible to... You know, I mean, I don't know how you feel, but like I'll go in with buyers on a property that looks really good. Kitchen's done, bathroom's done, new floors, new paint, exterior, sexy color, whatever. And then you do the inspections and it's like they didn't do a complete job of the systems. And so we're asking for $30,000 on the request for repairs. I represented a property where the seller didn't do half the roof on the garage. Like the visible half was updated but the non-visible other half was would shake, and? you know, and that came up in inspection. Sure did, and it's ultimately she hazard. had to replace it. Yeah, but it was like there are places where flippers tried to. I think not necessarily. I mean, it's not always cutting corners. It could just be about financing. You know, like look, I have a hundred grand to spend on this. Where's the best place to spend it? But you know, buyers expect that when you present a house like this beautiful thing, that the bones are going to be good. Two, right? I think it also depends on price point to go back to that. If it's beautiful and sort of in a first time home buyer starting price point, mm-hmm. I feel like you can be more forgiving than if you push up to a let's say, you know, listed for one five, you you are a two five by the time right. you're an escrow, you're like, you want everything done. Right. So mm-hmm. I right. agree to a point because I, I think that in lower spaces Buyers can't afford the big fixes if they need the big fixes. So even then, if it needs it, I think do it, you know, Mm -hmm. because a buyer who's buying a $700,000 house in LA, you know, even though that's on the lower end of the spectrum, 
it's still, you know, that they, they might have limited resources, especially if they're, you know, if they're utilizing like low down payment loans or, you know. That's a very good point. And that could cause a problem during the contract process because we're limited in how much closing cost credit the buyer can get by how much their closing costs actually are. So if the repairs that are needed are exceeding the closing costs, then, you know, it could kill the deal. Like yeah, totally. I, I got a call from an agent today who said, <coughs> my clients in escrow on the property, it needs three new foundation walls. Oh How am I going to handle that? So it is a problem that comes up for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if a flipper wants a smooth sale, then I think that they need to consider the biggest stuff like foundation. It should be a priority. Yeah. One more thing I'd like to add is that I think that flippers should be more considerate about doing systems work and actually, you know, taking care on the pieces that they pay attention to versus not for reputation purposes too. Because if you're a shitty flipper and you're doing half cocked flips, that reputation does follow you. Mm. You know, there's one who we all are aware of now, the butcher of Lamert, who has oh. gotten that name <laughs> oh, because everybody knows no permits, you know, shoddy work you know and, and it really impacts the resale price that is just a fact yeah every time you see the listing you see it sit the even whenever it's now. listed at a reasonable price point and the reason is because that reputation precedes them you can tell it you can see it mm -hmm. i actually saw one how recently do you really them. feel about that <laughs> 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 this is facts you can look it up and compare no but you know i actually saw one recently by them uh and it it had permits oh so ooh, i think okay. i think things We're are learning. changing i think something is is changing there. okay yeah and it was it was it was decent i mean we didn't inspect it because we didn't right. put an offer in on it so who knows but it looked good well that begs the question then should flippers do pre-inspections if like, they're wait. willing to fix what they find, yes. Fix or disclose what they find. Right. But that is not maybe not the best approach, in my opinion. No? You're no. going with no? What do you think, Nick? Well, if you're not willing to fix what's on the report and then you disclose it, yeah. how do you get the number you want? See, I, I think pre-inspecting is generally a good idea. I mm. mean, I think like I think in most situations it's a good idea because even if there's things on there that you find that are bad, one, if you aren't going to fix them, then it just lays it out on the table like this is what it is mm -hmm. and you are going to take it as it is because I'm not doing anything else. You know, but you also have the option then to correct that before a buyer's inspector gets in to see that thing and then makes a bigger thing out of it than it really is, mm -hmm. you know? So you have yeah. an opportunity there. But, you know, but I know a lot of people are skeptical for the reasons that you said, you know, just e even putting it. I'm a fan of, of pre-inspection yeah. if you're willing to fix. Yeah. If no, then let's just go and see what happens. Exactly. Some people mm. are skeptical because they're like, well, if something comes back, I, I don't want to fix see, it. See, to me, if I was a flipper and I'm asking and expecting the price that I want to get for a property, I would do a pre-inspection because I want to hold my contractors accountable if I write them the last check and they leave and then my, I go into escrow and my clients are like, or the buyers are like, we need $30,000 for this poorly done roof. Like I've seen that happen. Like a whole roof was done without permits, poorly done. And the buyers asked for an entirely new roof. Like I would be pissed, you know, I would want to like f go find that contractor. Guess what? Contractor is not in the country anymore. Contractor's out of here. Contractor mm -hmm. is not answering your call. Good yeah. point. Yeah. That's a good so point. to me, that it's just like a point. check and balance. Yeah. And then yeah. also like if I'm representing the seller and I have to disclose this report, then I can say the seller's willing to fix this, 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 and this so that the buyers know it's going to come up anyway. Right. You know, no. and you know, it is. I but guess I, there's several I, approaches to this. You know what else? You know? Mm -hmm. Agents have to know how to go over pre-inspection reports with their client. You can't just forward it. And that's the other thing I think that, to your point though, that kills the deal sometimes whenever there's a pre-inspection report that has things on it. If that agent just forwards it over to their client and doesn't go over it, those reports are written in a scary way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just normal stuff like an open junction box or you know some optional stuff like seismic mm -hmm. bolting, that's optional. 
But they make it sound like, oh, the house is going to fall apart if there's an earthquake, which we know is not true. So, you know, I do think it takes agents who are familiar with the inspection reports to, like, maybe help coach their client on how to read them before you have to make an offer or respond to a counter. Yeah, perspective is definitely important, but perspective also comes with experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know that there are a lot of agents out there who don't necessarily have the benefit of the experience getting those reports. So you see 120 pages and you might be like, oh, shit. Right. <laughs> 120 pages. Yeah. Like, this is fun. You know, not knowing, <laughs> not knowing that that's, you know, uh, every single house. Is almost, yes, like, right. I, I rarely have something under 100 pages on mm -hmm. an inspection report because there's little things that just in you know especially with LA houses that Things. were built in the 20s and 30s and 40s that aren't up to current code right, right. because they were built back in the day mm -hmm. you know but are still fine functioning things it's really you know a lot of it is really optional like do I want to um, fix it and the right. things that are like uh, that are must do yeah must do's are usually like in red or you know right. like there's something that says urgent in there with it you know you bring up a really good uh point about code because I've had a lot of buyers confused about what that means. They'll, they'll say, is this to code? Is that to code? And I'm like, codes change mm -hmm. every year codes change. So something could have been to code in 2019 and now it's not to code in 2020 or 2021. So I think that like, uh, the most important thing to focus on in the inspection process is not the code. It's, is there a health and safety concern or are there multiple health and safety concerns? that are valid and legitimate. Otherwise, you'd be tearing down and rebuilding houses all over the place and you wouldn't get those beautiful Spanish character homes like mm -hmm. we have and craftsmen's and all the things. Good point. Um, totally. Okay, so anything else you can think of that flippers should do system-wise that I haven't talked about? Should they fix the sprinkler system? Mm, I can tell you a big one. Oh, foundation. Okay. Oh, yeah. If there is a foundation issue, you should absolutely fix, fix it. Fix it. 100% because it will always come up and you don't know who is coming out to give an estimate on that foundation. Oh, yeah. And repair. we know companies that give different bits depending what zip code it's they're like in. It's like shooting yeah. fish in a barrel. <laughs> oh, my they're God. They're like, oh, scared buyer, foundation issue, payday, yes, you know. <laughs> I once had a company estimate $148,000 for a foundation repair and retaining wall repair on a property. What? And fortunately, my clients had friends who were, you know, in the business of retaining walls. And uh, and they gave them an alternate estimate for like 60 some thousand. So you can see. Like, yeah. The I have a horror story with regard to a foundation. This is not my finest moment, but it also wasn't my fault. So <laughs> I was I was uh, representing a buyer on a property. It was a fixer property. And thank God he was intending to do work to it. Okay. But we had our general inspection. The general inspector was like, the foundation is in really bad shape. You should get foundation inspectors out here. I was like, great, I'll get three. It was like the very baby beginning of my career. So I got three inspectors out and each one of them said, you need a brand new foundation. They give us different prices. At that time it was like 20 grand, 30 grand, 40 grand, right? So I don't remember Back if we got day. credits or what we did. We like went, moved forward, so day of closing. Day of closing, I'm handing over the keys to the buyer, and he's like, I'm going to drive my car down the driveway. And he starts and realizes that the car is too narrow, like the too narrow to get down the driveway. And there was a tree stump that was there. It's probably been there for 100 years that we never noticed. Nobody noticed. So it turns out none of the foundation people told us this. In some earthquake at some time, the house jumped up and moved over about a foot on the foundation. <laughs> so it moved into the driveway, essentially. So that's why it was too narrow to drive a car down. Now, wow. he wasn't too upset because he was planning on de replacing the foundation anyway. So now they had to tear down the wall and like remake the foundation, which they were going to do anyway. Thank God. But yeah, I mean, three foundation inspectors and none of them told us that he didn't find that out until after the fact. Is that crazy? crazy. That, that is crazy. crazy. How yeah. do you put it back on foot? You you take that whole entire wall off. You he had to take the wall that was up the mm. wall that had moved over. That whole corner of the house had to go away. Like wow. they had to take rebuild it. Basically, you have to rebuild the house. That's nuts. Yeah. That's but nuts. his property value is probably a million dollars more valuable than it was when I sold him that house. So and it he's makes all right. for a good story. <laughs> yeah, it makes for a great story. It's crazy. Okay. I want to talk about the good stuff now. Mm-hmm. Um what about design makes a good flip good? 
Can we talk about cabinet styles? What do you think? Well, I think for sure, you know, people should be more considerate about doing custom cabinets and do them know, or don't do them. Do, do them. them for sure. And usually doing them isn't much more than getting prefab cabinets, you know, but the impact is insane. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, with mm -hmm. custom cabinets, you can really get, you know, you can really switch it up with what you do. Like it doesn't have to be your typical shaker style. Shakers it, are in or out. You know, out. Well, no, I think shakers. Well, shakers okay. are in, they, but with all the, right. with all the, right. with the, it's okay. You can still say out. It's yeah. all right. It's a safe no, 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 space. No, safe I, space. I, I mean, out, Yes, in some places, but there has been good shaker. It depends. What it's makes custom, a good shaker good? Custom, custom, custom shaker. Color, custom shaker. Custom, custom shaker. The color, if it's, let's say, I've seen great white oak. Like the oak one. Yeah. Beautiful. It's really what you think yeah. about. And it depends what hardware you put on. So no, shaker can be really great. Oh, okay. No, they're like, you know, if you have custom shaker cabinets, then, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, again, aren't these like prefab ones that have that, it's a very... You can tell the ones that are just the typical ones. Right. They're like they have like a two inch lip or I don't know, the three inch something. Like that. Ones. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you have the custom ones, they like the ones with the thin lip around mm -hmm. the edge it just looks really Beautiful. refined. You know, like maybe it's like an inch mm -hmm. of a lip shaker mm -hmm. style. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think. Well, those gorgeous. are beautiful. I didn't yeah. even know they called them shaker as well. I yeah. thought shaker meant big framing no, and ugly because no. I love the thin frame beautiful yeah those are so those pretty are amazing so do you think that like flat front uh cabinets work in all houses no 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 i mean no. i think it depends how you do them you know like i think cabinets are really like you can really determine the vibe by the hardware mm. so if you're doing flat front fronts but mm -hmm. in like a historic home having like you know rejuvenation knobs mm. or you know, restoration hardware knobs can still make them feel. I think CB2 has some really great oh, hardware. Oh my God. Can great we go hardware. to CB2, please? And yes. Shamelessly <laughs> plug it in. It's like yes. the best place. Yes. And they have they I mean, they are great just... hardware. Like, I, I never even knew that all these years of, yeah. you know, that maybe four years ago I learned that CB2 did hardware. I don't even know if it's been that long, something like that. Um, but they have good ones because they have a different, mm -hmm. like, stone poles and, Yeah, so you know, pretty. Yeah, really pretty. Everything with marble right now, I'm so into. Yeah, because I'm, you know, I'm a fan of this, this reinvented Spanish that's not a full restoration, but that looks more like Tulum vibes or mm -hmm. more deserty mm -hmm. or something. And, you know, and even, like, wabi-sabi, you know, in the interior of it. But those, I think, flat fronts really work well. You know, it's, yeah. it, mm -hmm, even totally. though it's a 1920s house that's been completely reimagined, I think it can work. Um, but if it's not shaker and it's not flat front, what is the other kind of cabinet that works? Yeah, beadboard. Beadboard. Which is really fun. I mean, depending on how people use them. I've seen people use them in like, um, in like Tudors and like traditionals mm -hmm. well. You know, but or like also modern farmhouse. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've seen them in Modern Farmhouse, and that looks nice, especially when they do the paneling, like, on the wall as well. Like, that can mm -hmm. look really cool. Do you think buyers care about cabinets? For sure. Yes. I think yeah. cabinets are one of the yes. biggest, like, the biggest pieces of doing a reno right well. and well. You know, Cabinets and the hardware. The, ca the cabinets, the hardware, I mean, there's so Integrated many fridge. Yeah. Integrated Integrating dishwasher. That's very fancy. Meaning yeah. paneled. yeah. So you totally. don't see it's part of the it blends and you don't know it's an appliance because you to can't see to waterfall or not to waterfall on the island. Well, you know what? I used to be all waterfall mm -hmm. and now I'm more like, well, you don't have to. Yeah, it you depends. don't have to. But it depends. It depends can't be the answer it can't to be everything really, because no. I'm asking for it can be what really makes it but good. It can, no, but it can no, be you good. Know what? It, oh, it can yeah. be good. It can it, be but good. But see, this is the thing. You know, what makes it good really depends on the design overall. And what I see is that people try to pick pieces at sporadic times and fit them into the same picture when it's like, no, you have to come up with this picture first mm. and make sure that the whole thing collectively Ties works. Together. Right. Yeah. So like make you know, a storyboard. Yeah, like you know, mm. we have a waterfall countertop. I, I I typically go no on waterfalls. Really? But you know, but we have a waterfall at our listing right now on Danker that yeah. is 
Beautiful. Beautiful. I like my waterfall in my house. Yeah, I think see, it definitely your waterfall is beautiful. But, and Sometimes. mine's like a colonial house. Yeah. And the waterfalls are associated with like very modern kids. But, I, guess, but um, I what, think it works. But I guess the message, you can't, not automatically just, a waterfall doesn't make it good. Yeah. Okay. Like, it's like don't just do waterfall, waterfall and think, I'm not oh, now. I got this. Okay. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is the waterfall? What is the countertop? What right. is the stone you choose? Okay, let's What's talk about stone? countertops. Yeah. Talk about this. What is good? What do you walk in and you're like, oh my God, that's so good. That's a good, good design for countertops. I know what it is for me. I, for can I say what I'm really into right now is the Kalakata Paonazzo. Well, that say is that a, again. Know, Come again. Kalakata Paonazzo is the stone. Kalakata Paonazzo. Paonazzo. There's a lot going on. It's a very busy stone. Okay. You've probably seen it. Um, Ice Woon has it in her kitchen. That's her countertop. Okay. okay. And um, so it's got colors in it. It's got, it's got gold. It's got a lot of like, veins. It has a sophistication to it. What colors are in it? Um, dark. It, it comes in all kinds of colors, but okay. hers is white with dark, and it's it's gorgeous. Okay. Joseph Durant who we all love, yeah. he uses it a lot. And it's just, every time I see it, I'm like, oh, please, I, I want something you want that. from that stone. But I think they're like 7,000 a slab or something crazy. Well, you know what? Yeah. If you have a $2 million yeah. house, 7,000 a slab makes sense. Yeah. But this is just like what we tell our flippers. Maybe you splurge on the stone for your countertops because it makes such a big impact. And then you don't go with the most expensive, like bathroom tile, you can really do a lot with not a very expensive tile and make it feel very upscale and very on trend. My favorite countertop of all time forever is <laughs> soapstone. Oh, I love it I so love much and I don't get to see it enough. And every time I walk into a house that has it, I'm like, Oh, and it's timeless and it has a patina and it ages well and it never looks dated. And it's just like comforting somehow True. like farmhousey. I don't know. I, love soapstone yeah i love soapstone too and i love that it has a texture yeah you know like nice. i love textured oh, yes. countertops yeah. yes. like concrete countertops like we had clients who had those custom concrete or concrete counters poured mm -hmm. and even had a waterfall in concrete and that looked great and it looked amazing yeah you know but i i, I mean there's so many countertops that i like oh my god do you like leathered granite yes and there's a travertine that's beautiful yes yeah, yeah. It, that i has think we've sort got a travertine a surprise coming up we do Ooh. we yes. have stunning tell me more travertine coming in our kingsley listing oh, yes oh. it's coming oh it's god. coming it is, okay well it's amazing it's honestly amazing everything they did with it is stunning i think stones with texture are a win yeah yeah Totally. So no no more of the just white quartz from Ikea. That just doesn't work anymore. I, that is something that I'll say I have never enjoyed. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> to me, it's, it's about where the seam is. Like if uh, I can see that it's been cut in a million no, pieces yeah, or like these seams horrible. get dirty and it's, stuff, I'm yeah. like, oh, it looks so cheap. It just lacks, it lacks personality. Yeah. Like, yeah. yes, quartz, you know, people like quartz. They like the dur durability of it and mm -hmm. all that, whatever. But generally, I just, I, I feel like, Okay, people can make it look good. They can pair it up with things and make it look fine. But it's not an elevated stone, in my opinion, if you're really trying to go for, like, a big bang in mm -hmm. the kitchens or the bathrooms. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It was for a second, though, like, better than granite. But yeah. now it's like, <laughs> oh, my God, better than granite. There are other options. If that's all we got. Better I mean, than you granite. put your block is better than uh, granite. No. You know? oh, Remember block. when that was a thing? That was a thing. Oh, oh it's I mean, it was like your block countertops like 10 years ago. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> totally. Okay, so um, tiles. Bathroom tiles. Yeah. Go. <laughs> Okay, well, one, I think we need to stop with the just basic subway. It's we just need to together stop. stop. We'll, we'll, pretty much. I mean, I, I just no, the, the staggered, just, yes. yeah, the staggered stop. subway tile, it's just like so overdone. You know what I hate? What? Black grout white subway tile. Oh, oh God. My God. The <laughs> worst. That, no. Okay, when it's grounded white, it's like acceptable enough. It exists. It's fine. It disappears. It's unoffensive, but it's right. not like, wow, I love it. But the... <laughs> Oh my god! I just get so infuriated when I see black grout. I know. And so white Me like, too. Why? I don't know. I don't. I honestly, I think everyone should just aim with grout to match the tile. Yeah. Like, why make it complicated? Why throw another thing in there? Unless it's really purposeful and intentional in the design, which I feel like it's not really. Rarely. No, yeah. Rarely. Not. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I think buyers have caught on to Subway guys. Like, I think they understand Subway tile. They know it's cheap. And they're like, 
mm, not very interested. It's yeah. boring. It's yeah. like a boring choice. Like, oh, they obviously yeah, cut this they corner. Know better. There's a way that it can be installed, especially when it's like the smaller ones that Those aren't, aren't the like really subway tiles. Well, but though. you know, it's like it, it's pretty much it's a They're rectangular skinny. tile. They're you skinny know? rectangular tiles. Right. But like you know, even with subway, I've seen people taking those like ones that are typically your subway and stacking them vertically, mm-hmm. you know, so that they're all aligned, and it looks so much better. Yeah. Than the staggered, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm a fan of the hand subway. poured subway tiles, if we want to call them that, but. To me, it's more about color. Mm -hmm. Like the muted tones, the Sahara collection from Bedrosian Tile is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's like earth tones and clay. and Oh, I just love it so much. And it's not so glossy. So it feels more like stone, looks more like stone, I should say, than than like subway tile. That's the texture again. That's That's the texture. So Mm -hmm. texture's on. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. One more thing, and then I have a very special guest that I would like to invite to join our conversation, and I will get there. Um, but light fixtures. We talked about it in, in, in episode one where Silka likes to get the best light fixtures, which is Etsy. But by and large, what's on trend for light fixtures right now? You know, I think light fixtures is a place that a lot of people don't spend. And they you should. Know, and they should. They mm-hmm. should absolutely. <laughs> you know, and I mean, you can get really bougie with light fixtures. Plus, like, it gives us something bougie. to talk about. Yeah. You only need one designer light fixture, like truly a designer light fixture, and it adds so much value. If totally. they know, like, the dining chandelier is done by a name designer, I think it, it does add a ton of value. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Totally. I mean, you know, one thing I love about Rob Diaz, who Silka mm. was just mm. bringing up this morning because he's so amazing. Mm, he is. Um, <laughs> is that in his designs, he uses fixtures that most people won't pay for, you know, like the apparatus studios, you know, mm, yeah. like we love it and we see it and we just adore it. But, you know, a lot of people, they'll just order from Lowe's or Home Depot Lamps or, or Amazon, you know, Amazon, or Wayfair, you or know, Lamps Plus. And, yeah, or Lamps Plus. <laughs> like, oh, my God, just shoot me. Honestly. You know, what? And you know what? I, I want to say this really important advice for flippers. Buy your light fixtures earlier on in the process so that you're not about to go on the market trying to find light fixtures that yes. can ship because sometimes the good Three ones months. have a four to six week or six mm-hmm. to eight yes. week delay. Mm-hmm. Like plan for that. The, the good ones are usually custom made, mm-hmm. yeah. which means, eight, you know, six weeks, 10 yep. weeks, you know, something like that to make. But also like I've, I've seen that some designers literally focus their entire design around the light fixtures. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you do it right and, you know, just like we were talking about earlier, you plan for it all to coordinate together. Mm-hmm. It can be so good. So but when good. you're randomly throwing things into the mix, it can be so bad and it can have such an identity crisis, yeah. which is like one thing that, you know, is like seriously going to take away from your buyer pool. Yes. You know, if you have people who are looking for a specific aesthetic, then if there's things that are just throwing it off or it just looks hodgepodgey, it's just not going to work. Yeah, mm-hmm. I totally agree. So. How about mixing metals? How do we feel I about love that? Mixed metals. You do? I do. Oh. <laughs> I don't think I'm a fan. Oh my God. What? <laughs> done right. Yeah. Well, when is it done right? What? What are you talking so, about? What? Oh my God. You've got okay, silver what? and gold, like brushed brass and chrome in a kitchen? Well, chrome should be. Not even allowed to be sold. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. No, you know, mixing metals can actually like make things look more curated because you know, like it's one thing to just kind of throw random things in random places, but it's another thing to like, you know, to tie together the fixtures with the same metal, but then have the hardware in a different metal to give you a little bit of an offset there. You know, mm. sometimes when things are too samey, samey. It's like, okay, yeah, like you That's ordered true, all the matte black I would just, and whatever. Yeah, but know. instead of doing all samey-samey, I would rather mix the texture. Oh, everything's black, now do wood poles or like marble yeah, or something that like that cool. as opposed to like mixing gold and silver. But anyway, I, I don't know. I'm not, I don't think I can agree with you on that one. <laughs> all right. Well, just look up Emily Henderson's blog. Okay. Emily Henderson. <laughs> okay. Emily Henderson. <laughs> just because she's famous doesn't mean I love everything <laughs> um i did get these um, uh, like amazing clay i know i'm uh, like saying like, the same thing over like and over again good. but it was a clay flush mount 
very unassuming, mm. so simple, but it, you open the door, you look at the light, and it's so much better than a nipple light. Just so much better. It <laughs> just looks like, oh, or you know, cans. it's understated mm. elegance. And I think sometimes people can overdo it with lighting too. You don't even have to try that can hard. We can oh about gosh, recessed yes. lighting and can we just oh, say, oh, do not please. do recessed lighting. I know. Just recessed don't. Lighting you know, I'd like rather have no light than recessed light. I know, because, because we want a vibe. Beautiful. You can we buy need lamps. dimmers. Yes. Thank you. Thank yeah. You, you see, you know, I, I'm, I'm generally... Of course More you are. Sconces. But I will say, okay, I enjoy when people do a, like a mix of small, you know, the the like the smaller recess lights. I can't remember what size they are, but I was mm. just talking to someone about it. Because like when you have the big ones, it looks yeah. just like so cheap. 90s. But when you have the smaller ones and then you also have like a fixture, then you really get to decide are you going like, you know, full right? right? Are you going, sometimes you want a bright room, you know, and sometimes really? like, you know, the fixture, it gives you just that romantic lighting. So I always um, want romance in yeah, my lighting. I'm, I'm, she's sometimes bank. I want to read. <laughs> get a reading lamp. Get. I know what to get you for Christmas this year. <laughs> we left off a really critical piece of what makes a great flip great. And that is the staging. We are joined today by Eden Roundtree, the owner of Odin and Friday Home Staging, one of our very favorite stagers in all of Los Angeles. We're so excited to talk to her about how she does her job and what makes great staging great. So join us, Eden. Yay! Yay! Yeah, I know you. you've got like three or four of our stages going on right now, so we're T glad today. you can make the time. <laughs> yeah. Today. So we're, we've been talking about what makes a good flip good or a great flip great, and a large part of that is staging. So I'd love to know more about you and how you got into staging and what you were doing before. Oh, well, before I was a stay-at-home mom. It wasn't until I was shopping for my own house that I saw, I didn't even know staging was a thing. Mm. I just always loved de design and how rooms made you feel, but when I was shopping for my own home in 2012, I couldn't, I was like, wait, people are living here? They're not, oh, okay. And I just thought it was really, really rad that there was a business that was you know, there to help buyers envision themselves, and then also kind of to help sellers too, to mm -hmm. let go, to uh, you know, maybe get more money for their property, et cetera. So yeah, but before that, I had no idea that it was even a, a thing, mm. staging, so. You've grown a lot in the past couple of years. Yeah, yeah. With, that with you guys, though. Hey. Too. <laughs> um, no, it's been amazing because uh, when I first started, it was really, I didn't take any investment. I just went from job to job building slowly. And so a lot of times in the beginning, I would have a vision of what I wanted the space to like look and feel like, but I just didn't quite have the inventory that matched that. Mm -hmm. So it's now having some of that inventory that, I, that helps me sort of see it all is like, it's very exciting. It's a special yeah. skill what you <laughs> yeah. do, really it is. What do you think is the hardest thing about your job? About staging? Mm -hmm. I'm 100%, it's a lot of schlep. It's a lot, I mean, it's a great workout, keeps you fit, but it's, uh, I've had so many um, people come and intern for the day to check it out. And, uh, you know, they don't call back because I don't think they were expect. <laughs> I think they were thinking like staging, like styling a shelf, which it is. But, you know, 75, 80% of it is carrying bags in and out and in and out. So it's the physical aspect. I think it's pretty mm -hmm. tough. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. We don't even think about that. It's true. And especially as you grow, you have to like have more warehouses mm -hmm. and like. You have to yeah. hire movers and do all those things too. All of it. Were you planning for that? Did you know that going in? Like, um, it, I mean, listen, it's daunting because you know I was like, do you have to own the inventory? Do you rent it? Uh, and I was kind of by the seat of my pants over the first few months. Um, but yeah, it is a process of that. Ultimately, I think if you're an authentic stager or, or an artist or whatever, you kind of want pieces that are yours. You don't want to just rent them. Mm -hmm. So that does mean that you have to then have movers and warehouse spaces and you know, movers, sometimes things get damaged. So it's just a lot of like turnover. But um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, parts about the business that I've, you know, you had, to <laughs> had to figure out. Yeah. Had to figure out. Yeah, so what do you sure. think is the difference between good staging and bad staging? I'm sure you've seen some bad staging, right? Um, a little bit. I mean, I don't want to... <laughs> I know how hard stagers work, so I just I'll say it like this. Maybe some do work hard, and some maybe don't work that hard. Well, I think it's I think it's um, 
when I walk into a space um, or I see a space that is like good staging in it, it makes me feel excited. I kind of like, you know, like, oh my God, or, or it makes me fall in love with the house. Do you know, sometimes the houses and you just need a little encouragement from the stagers mm -hmm. to help buyers see it. Um, and so I want someone else to walk in and have that feeling. So when I walk in and the stager has maybe, let's say, phoned it in or not put a lot of thought into it, or, you know, you walk in sometimes and the layouts are so janky and make, there's no flow to it. Oh my God. And you're like, what did they do? They just threw a sofa there? Like you have to like sort of think about the buyers when they're walking in. What's the first thing the buyer's going to see? They're mostly going to be on foot walking through the house. So the house has to have a good flow to it, but also things have to make sense. You don't want to just stick a chair somewhere just to stick, stick a chair. You want to make it have a purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, which says, yeah, it has to have a flow to it, something kind of magical. Dominique and I had a listing one time where the sellers, which were corporate sellers, insisted on using some stager that they had used before who was probably very cheap. Mm -hmm. And all the furniture was oversized. They put the dining room in the wrong place. It was a mess. So literally, we had the open house. We fought with them. They, they insisted on the stager. We even had her come back and restage it because it was so living spaces that we were just like, oh, God, this is so bad. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's what we do, though. When we walk in and we're like, this isn't right, we'll call a stager and be like, yo, you got to remake this bed. I don't know where you got shiny brown pillows or the thing because they're not the thing. I had to do that <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> In Orlando, I wasn't cheating. Okay. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, but you know, it's like, it's like we, Nick and I, in order to sell the house, physically moved the dining table. Like we reorganized the furniture for the second showing for these buyers. So they could see that the living room was actually bigger and that it was just this oversized dining table that was eating into the living room size. Like we physically had to do the work of moving. So I, I, I can't even imagine doing that all the time, but it's like sometimes it, it leaves us the agents in a difficult situation whenever the staging is bad. Yeah. You know, especially if the seller is persistent. You know? Well, I think, I mean, listen, I always appreciate the chance to fix something. Every single client has, you know, different quirks and likes and, you know, of course, the demographic, who are you selling the house to, the area. So I always appreciate, hey, Eden, listen, we're not really, you know, digging this. Can you come change this out? And I'm happy to do that. I, I actually like collaborating. So. That is why we love you. Okay. You are so <laughs> unique in that way. Yes. Okay. A lot of people are like, this is it. I'm not coming back. I had a stager tell me. And I, and I do, you know, I liked her work, but she told me, I don't run errands. And I was like, um, can we add like, you know, these lamps don't work. Or like this thing isn't quite right. And whatever she, I said, there's a target right there. You know, she's like, yeah, I don't run errands. I was okay. like, oh, <laughs> so guess who did? You this did. guy yeah. went and yeah. restaged the entire room. Yeah. You know, which was like, I'm like, I'm paying, you know, I wasn't, I was contributing to the staging on that one, I think. Yeah. Do you, uh, you know, but anyway. Anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, bad staging, you know, if you have an agent who's aware of it, like we walk in and we can feel it too. I'm like, shit, like something needs to change here. Yeah, so it's a vibe. It's a vibe. It's, it's a, a total it's a vibe. vibe. Yeah. It's also the pieces. You have amazing pieces. Well, like I said, that was, that was, yeah. that took, that took a minute. Um, but when I started to be able to sort of buy things, not because I needed them randomly, but just because it was like, oh, this is a piece I've been dying for. Like the lines of things and the colors and the textures y'all were talking about earlier with furniture, though, it's like, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's exciting. I like it. Tell us about layering. How do you decide how much or how little to do? Um, okay, so I don't know if there's always a method to the creativity. Like sometimes it's just you have an idea ahead of time. Uh, and you kind of plan things, but then you get there the day of, and it's like, oh, actually, it, the measurements fit, but it just doesn't work. So I will, like, I'll go and switch stuff out, and sometimes I'll just throw everything at it, and then I walk back in, and I'm like, oh, my God, no, that's bothering me. That's just, like, the balance of things. But sometimes you don't always... I think maybe if there's stagers who are, you know, a bit more flat in terms of, you know, what they convey, it's not a matter of anything. But I think because we're trying to sort of make people feel something, it is... You have to kind of fine tune it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it's sometimes you, I just throw it all in and it's like, oh my God, that's so much weight. <laughs> take this out, take that out, take that out. So it's just and then, editing. You're and just then, editing for overall lot, feel. A lot. And then something just when it fits into place, like everyone, all the team starts being like, oh my God, and start swearing. Like, oh, great. <laughs> you know, like, How many people do you have on your team? Um, let's see. I've got April, who's amazing, the best, uh, Johnny. And then I've got a team of, of guys that are just, they work so hard. They move and schlep for me. 
me, and they're, mm -hmm. they're amazing. Carlos and Carlos and another Carlos. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and Matt, who helps at, at the warehouse. So it's it took me a while, though, to find people. The right people. It did, yeah. It mm -hmm. really, really did. But um, they worked their asses off. And they're creative and wow. fun and, and nice people too. So that's yeah. the key. It really, I feel like that's what we've God. done in Acme. You know, it took a while. Yeah. And and honestly, I love the people that we work with. Like we really love each other. Like mm -hmm. we really feel connected to each other. And and that's that's what makes the job like wonderful. You know, also, it's all though, about think, the people. I think it makes. I think it's also part of like what makes I think Acme a really cool company because I think you all convey that. You know what I'm saying? I, I think you guys convey that sort of uh, thing with, uh, you know, that you like each other and you've got a nice group of people. I think it conveys. I do. Oh, Thank you. That. That's yeah. such a high compliment. Yeah. I know you work with a lot of people, so we'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, where do you get your inspiration from? Um, I, was, I was thinking about this. I was like, okay, so it's funny. A lot of, a lot of it is music. Um, uh, <laughs> you play music while you're staging? No, well, I just, I just, music moves me a lot, and you know, I want the the staging to move people too. So um, a lot of it's just music. Like I'll start thinking about like a a, a song that I like. I really, really, really like rap music. It's my favorite. Oh. Um, sorry, I know. It's <laughs> so like, that's unexpected. So <laughs> who's your favorite rapper? Um, okay, so I've been listening to um, the Cool Kids. Okay. And Father, he's he's from the South, and. Um, who was the? So you like put it on while you're staging? I'll put it on while I'm staging. Um, some of the guys don't like the rap because I kind of like the sort of you know the deep bass, dirty, <laughs> dirty rap. Clearly, <laughs> <laughs> really, it's my favorite. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. let's go. <laughs> you naughty, naughty yes. bass. That's wow. what inspires oh me too. I, I think love I'm it. blushing. Right now. <laughs> I love it. I I love it. Um, so. <laughs> But no, it's like I'll sort of start by thinking of like just random stuff, like okay, like Joy Division, but then also oh. I like you know N.W.A. So I start thinking about like you know the bands or the songs that I like, and also so we'll Google that until I'll fall into like a Google hole of like colors that the album did, and it also but That's also so cool. it, it always comes back to the house though, really ultimately, what is the house asking for, you know? Yeah, but, totally. Love so that. music, my I thought my she kid. was going to say jazz, okay? And because I was thinking of Kingsley and how beautiful your staging was at that house, and it really transformed that space. I mean, that was just... It was such a fun one to wow. do, too. It was yeah. just amazing. And it felt like jazz to me. It felt like such an interesting... It was gangster eclectic. rap. It was gangster <laughs> rap, in fact. Okay, that that was one, so that wrong. That one might have been a little Chet Baker, actually. <laughs> it might have been a little bit, okay. but... Actually, no, that was the green velvet dining chairs. That's what made that place. Yes. Bar yeah. none. Yeah. That was amazing. Well, it was also um, the Clementine chairs in the living room. Oh, yeah, which those we were loved, cute, too. Loved yeah, so much. Yeah. Um, so I was going to ask you a, a couple other things. Like, what, what magazines do you read? What shops do you love? What, like, design shops do you love what they're doing right now? Like, how about those kinds of inspirations? Um... Magazines, I think uh, the European ones are, are always really good. Um, but I don't know. Honestly, I'll kind of just go to the bookstore and the magazine section and get lost and try and find some. I, what was the one I was reading recently? Was it um, uh, UK, uh, L, Living? Yeah. Um, those, are, Decor, those are pretty good. UK. Oh, and then this other book. What's that? Um, Athena Calderon? Mm. Oh, my God. Wound. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Ice wound. Her yeah. book is beautiful. Um, do you follow her on Instagram? Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> you like to watch her arranging things? God. She's so good at it. And also, she's got such great style. I wish I could get millions of followers just for walking around my kitchen like moving it. How I but she, but she, 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 she glides. It to she the glides. Left, back to the right, back to the left, and that's it. Just right. Yeah. So yeah. Easy. Sometimes a little much. <laughs> But still, we can't you look watch away. it. You can't yes, look away. I do. Yeah. You can't look away. It's mesmerizing. No, she's she's good. She's fluid. She's got her thing, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but yeah, what are the design things? I, honestly, I do think you can find good design stuff kind of everywhere. Like, you can find good elements at Target, actually. Um, I mean, I think CB2 is really killing it. And... Mm -hmm. You know, they're not like cheap, cheap, but they're also not like expensive, mm -hmm, expensive. Mm -hmm. And they're doing some really exciting stuff with like the just the lines of the, the you know, the, the color choices. It's, it's they really up their game, didn't they? They are killing it, killing it, killing it. Um, so they're they're fantastic. But you can, you know, you can mix stuff in from Target and all modern. If you do it right, you know, you can it's how you sort of balance it all together. 
Um, but all modern can be a really good accessible choice for people. Um, uh, Amazon, not so much, but right. <laughs> I haven't really had a lot of luck with Amazon lately. Um, but yeah, I said, well, yeah, CB2 is probably my favorite at the moment. Just easy kind of like going online. The pandemic, though, changed a lot in terms of you know, being able to go to stores and seeing things in person. Mm -hmm. So it is a lot kind of looking around online these days. What do you see as the future of staging? Like, what do you think is going to change? Um, I, that's so change in terms of like the, the business. I don't know. It could be design. Like, what do you see coming or oh, the trend business? wise, trend Trends wise or, or the business? Well, I would hope that um, I would hope that there's more stage. I mean, I know that there's been a, a lot of staging companies that have sort of opened in the past couple of years. Um, I would just hope that there would be more that would continue to take chances and be a little exciting and a little mm -hmm. unexpected with it. Um, it. Certainly, when I see other stagers that are doing good work, it makes me want to up my game. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my god, look what they're doing. It's beautiful. Oh, look, I want to do something beautiful too. So I think we can all sort of push each other in a positive way. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of trends, I don't know, maybe, and maybe too, it's the buyers that are also quite savvy, don't mm -hmm. you think? Um, so, yeah. so, in LA, yeah. so there, I would feel like there would be more room for, you know, cool stagers to, to be in business because the market could, is like up, up for that and knows what's Would you what's be good. willing to consider this business opportunity? I'm about to <laughs> hurl at you right now. <laughs> Would you be open to training other stagers across the country in how to choose the right pieces for inventory to achieve a similar look? I mean, sure. I would love to help okay. people. I, I don't know how that would look, but sure. I think I, I, think I have a business idea here, guys, because <laughs> um, you know, I think some parts of the country need a little help with their staging. And, oh, uh, just don't take her away from LA. No, this can be done via Zoom. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What's that thing called? It's Zoom. They Zoom. Started, yeah. yeah. Came that big in the pandemic for sure. <laughs> you think everybody can be a stager? Uh, I don't. Nope. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think a lot of stagers maybe get into the staging wanting to do interior design. I'm actually probably the only stager in LA that doesn't want to do interior design. I like staging. I like thinking about houses that are going to sell. Um, but yeah, it's, I think what I was saying earlier is I think a lot of people start it and they're like, oh, it's going to be styling and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's all the other moving parts to it. That's a, a, a bit much. So no, I don't think everyone can stage or so, should stage. To wrap, <laughs> what do you think is the number one skill that a great stager has? Uh, flexibility. hundred <laughs> percent. Flexibility, like physically or in their scheduling? No, I just think in in uh, how they sort of look at things. It's there's constantly, and y'all know this. There's so many yeah. moving parts with real estate. Sometimes the contractors aren't finished, or mm -hmm. you know, you're expecting inventory to come back in from a, from another job to put here, and it doesn't come in, or things don't get shipped in time, and you have to really think on your feet, but also be flexible enough to sort of within those confines still be creative and make make magic. Yes. Well, you do make so much magic. Oh, Thank you so much for joining right. us thanks today. Thanks for having me, y'all. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thanks. Woo. Love some eating. All right, let's start the rapid fire round, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what is out for flippers? Go. Vinyl windows. Okay. Laminate floors. <laughs> Sparse landscaping. Ooh. Chrome anything. <laughs> mm. um, overuse of DG, which also kind of ties into sparse landscaping. Uh -huh. <laughs> fake flowers. Fake flowers. Fake orchids. Fake fruit. Fake orchids. Do fake not fruit. ever. <laughs> no. Yes. Okay. I have also, thank you, a short list of things that flippers think are good but are actually awful. Okay. okay. Let's go. Tell me if you agree with me here. Lighted crown molding. Agreed. <laughs> Yes, Lighted agree. crown molding. <laughs> okay, under the cabinet lighting in the kitchen. Oh my god. Depends. Depends? <laughs> yes, I've seen it oh used no. well. But whenever it's bright blue, yeah. that's oh a great fluorescent or colored uh, uh, rainbow colors. Terrible. No. Yes. Bathroom mirrors that when you touch them turn on in a fluorescent way. I agree. No, yeah, that's I agree a no. With that. Oh, terrible. Subway tile, everything, of course. How about mm -hmm. this one? Those Spanish style tiles from Home Depot. Oh my God. Where the, the paint in the sun just disappears after one year. Oh. And it's just 
sad. So sad. So sad. Anything else you think that some flippers think are good things, but they're actually terrible, terrible things? Giant recessed lights. Oh, for yeah. Sure. Totally. Mm -hmm. Cheap, square, black shower heads. Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, the square shower so heads. <laughs> I, I hate it, they, they could be black, they could be chrome. Yes, be, I guess. <laughs> not uh, square. Square <laughs> shower heads. Square, like anything faucet related. Like I hate when they have the whole matching set. Oh and my it's God. like the square spout and <laughs> the square handle and the square shower heads. Just horrible. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Pre-made cabinets. Okay. Yes. Pre-made cabinets for sure. Mm -hmm. I can't stand the handles that are round and they're like brush nickel and they look like 15 years ago. The, the pulls, mm -hmm. the drawer pulls, they're round. Or the just basic matte black, like just single line ones. Do you know what I'm talking? They're probably the cheapest matte are black Are they square? They're, they're literally just like a line. Just a line. Black line. But people will use it on everything. It's like if you're going to use it, mix it up. Put mm -hmm. a knob somewhere. Mm -hmm. Put a you know knob I mean? somewhere. Yeah. Yep. What are you afraid of? A little knob? <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared of a little knob. I'm not scared of a knob. <laughs> okay, so to wrap up, what do you think overall Nick, makes a great flip great? Parting thoughts. Intentional execution. You know, mm -hmm. making sure that you're being considerate of one, the bones, and making sure that it's a livable, functional house that someone's not going to have to have, you know, come out of pocket tens of thousands of dollars for after the fact, mm -hmm. but also making sure that from the beginning you think about your overall design and does it make sense? Does everything, mm -hmm. you know, work together? Mm -hmm. What do you think, Silke? Yeah, same. Thoughtful design. Thoughtful design. Mm -hmm. To me, it's, um, it's uh, like character, uniqueness in a way that's maybe uh, inspired by current design trends, but is you know, has something so special about it that buyers are emotionally in love with the house and know they can't get something just like it somewhere else. So to me, it's like character, intentional character, you mm -hmm. know, really yeah. making it feel different. For sure. There's yeah. nothing worse than seeing the same reproduced house palette every time. over and over and yeah, over, again over again because it's something that they found and it works, and they've probably bought all those materials in bulk. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and every yeah. house will look the same. <laughs> right. And I when know. in doubt, just ask your renovation resale realtor. Yes. Yes. yes please. please pull us in to yes. this decision-making. Yes. Totally. At the very beginning. Yeah, like at the before, beginning. Before oh, you go buying whoa, stuff. We before the floor plan is all fucked Identity up. crisis. Oh. Uh, well, that is a huge thing, yes. Okay. We forgot about that. Yes. Identity crisis for sure happens way too often. Like, why are you turning a like a, a like Tudor house into a Spanish interior? That right, mm -hmm. or a mid-century house into a Spanish interior. I've seen or that. A mid-century hmm? house into contemporary. A horrendous. Spanish house with a contemporary door. Oh, oh my god! god. Oh, I've seen that the so many times. Can we talk doors. about the front the doors? Contemporary doors out. The contemporary no, doors. no, yes. no. Yes, please. Get Please, rid of those yes. panel doors. Oh, they're so bad. Oh my god. Oh my god. What so was the bad. other thing? Bad floor plans. Oh, yes. yeah. Bad floor plans. Like floor plan is everything. Mm -hmm. Space is everything and how it functions is everything. But people mm -hmm. like, you know, they just try to fit as much as they can fit into there sometimes or as little, you know, they try to make it like this super open concept, which is out. We're, yeah, open mm -hmm. concept. People don't want you that would super say, open right? concept it's anymore. Not anymore. No. no. They want storage. Back it's back in in trend to not have an open floor yeah. plan. To it's semi open. Is semi on trend. Semi open. Yeah. Semi open. You mm -hmm. can flow through, but you also have space to have your own space. If you mm -hmm. have other people also in the house with you, twenty four hours a day because you're in quarantine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One more bit of advice as we wrap up: If the ceilings are low, install skylights. It's so cheap and makes such a huge impact. So that's what we're looking for with our flippers. I'd like to give a special shout out to Runway Boutique, our neighbor in West Adams at 4755 West Adams Boulevard. She has the cutest boutique store and this hat I got from, from there. So thanks, Fatima. We're going to shout you out here. And thank you to you guys for joining me in for this fantastic conversation. And we'll see you guys on the next episode of Under All is the Land.
See you next time. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Coming to you live from Acme Real Estate in Los Angeles, California. It's under all is the land. With your host, Courtney Polis, Silka Fernald, and Dominique Madden. Yeah. Under all.